in case you're driving in your car or something, this audio helps you get a handle on the device that's used in the Bible, which I call meter. It the classification of this meter is it's just it's a rhetorical device. It's a ha ha sometimes. It's a oh see how cute this is. Other times it's profound. Like let me throw some words at you in English, so you get the sense of what I'm what kind of genre this is. Chucker. Anybody who's been watching the news with Donald Trump immediately knows what that means. I do not have to explain it. In fact, it's better that I don't. Oh, he's a choker. Well, the origin of that is Donald Trump mistyped choker to reference Mitt Romney and some of the other candidates in the debates. And so all you have to do to somebody familiar with all that backdrop is just say choker. And they'll laugh. Okay? Or if you said windows, W-I-N-D-O-Z-E in writing, people would go, oh yeah, yeah, that means the time, the many times when windows is suddenly slow and you don't know why. But I don't have to say all those words. I just say windows and I spell it D-O-Z-E. Okay? Um, something else, like if I say matrix, who doesn't think of the movie? If I say Nix, who doesn't think of the basketball team? But you'll notice that each one of these words could mean something else if you're not, as it were, in on the lingo, in on the style, in on the background. That's exactly what the meter is doing. It's something that was well known, that everybody used all day long. They were all familiar with it. And so by doing it in creative ways, it would make the material more interesting, more memorable, more useful. And you could get the meaning out of the text better. Because you know how much we ponder. Or what do these words mean in the Bible? That's what the meter does. It's very kind of prosaic. All right? And counting syllables and learning what a syllable is is something you learn when you're five years old. Okay, so to see evidence of syllable counting as a rhetorical device is pretty important on a number of levels. Not only that, but other cultures do the same thing. In fact, one of the main ways that they do it that we all actually still use today, we call it poetry or rhyming. But it doesn't have to rhyme. Around the rugged rock, the ragged rascal ran. You see, there's a sort of cadence to it. All right, but that depends on you counting syllables. Around the rugged rock, six. The ragged rascal ran, six. See, it's a balancing of six to six. You know, around the shores that, let's see, on the shores that round our coast from Deal to Ramsgate span, I found alone on a piece of stone an elderly naval man. His hair was weedy, his beard was long, and weedy and long was he. And I found this white on the sh I heard this white on the shore recite in a singular minor key. Oh, I am the cook and the captain's bold and the mate of the Nancy Brig, a bosun tight, and I forget the rest of it. I learned that like 50 years ago. And yet... See how easy it is to just come up? That's what meter does also. It helps you remember the cadence and therefore the words. And the best news of all for us is we can know that we have the same words that the original writers wrote. Especially if other writers in the Bible are playing on the syllable counts of another Bible passage. Which... I found a bunch of them that do. Now that's a pretty significant find. I found it by mistake. You don't credit the Bedouin tribes guy who wandered into the caves of Qumran and find all those manuscripts. You credit the manuscripts. So you don't credit me, you credit the Bible. But it's still a significant find, right? And since right now I'm the only person, almost the only person on the planet who knows about this, because there's some people who have discovered it in the eight years I've been writing about it, 
since I'm almost the only person on the planet who's discovered this, I gotta talk about it. Okay? But you can see why it'd be important, kind of like that, you know, made of the Nancy Brig, fate of the Nancy Brig poem. Except this isn't poetry. That That's the big difference. For 300 years, since a guy named Robert Loth, L-O-W-T-H, you can go look that up in Google, Bible scholars have been debating whether the Bible has what they call poetry or meter in it. But they've been trying to find it based on Western standards of what constitutes meter. And part of Western standards of what constitutes meter is what is often called, you know, in classical Greek, they call it iambic or, the, you know, they have different names. I don't remember all of them. And they're looking for that same kind of thing in Bible. But the Bible has meter, but it doesn't have the same kind of structure. So they're missing it. That's all. I found it by mistake. I found it by mistake when I was trying to figure out if Isaiah 53 had missing words. Because there's a guy named Moeller, M-O-E-L-L-E-R, who's on the internet. You can Google on his name too. Isaiah, Great Isaiah Scroll Moeller, M-O-E-L-L-E-R. And they'll take you right to the site where, you know, photocopies of the Molar Scroll exist. And there's this big gap in Isaiah 53.10. And I was trying to figure out what that was, what words were left out. And one of the scribes had penned in or, meaning light. And that word light is false in the Greek translation. So it's like, okay, is that one of the missing words? And then what are the missing words? And I couldn't figure out how to test it. And then suddenly it hit me. Oh, well, let's count the syllables, find the cadence. And then after we get the cadence, we can know how many syllables Isaiah intended. Well, it turns out no syllables were missing. Isaiah 53 is a perfectly balanced meter. Now, what is the meter? If you're not too bored already, it's basically a syllable counting exercise. And if you learn it early enough in life, it becomes like habit. Just like you can recite your ABCs while you brush your teeth. You don't even think about it. You know, we made little songs for our kids. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And in Spanish, they did the same for numbers. Dos y dos son cuatro. Cuatro y dos son seis. Okay? So we tend to take things that are building blocks and we make them repetitive and we teach them to our kids so it's easier for the kids to remember. That's what this meter does. Now it's structured in a pretty basic way. You count the syllables until they're divisible by seven. Evenly divisible by seven like 49, 63, 84, 21, even seven. That first time in a passage that this happens is telling you when the person wrote what you're reading. But it's not just saying, well, it was written in blah, 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 A.D. No, 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 it's more clever than that. For example, Moses, when he wrote the book of Genesis, first chapter, and when he wrote Psalm 90, he did both in the same year. And to make sure you know that, the first time his text sevens, counting the syllables, is at 63. Now, 63 is a really important biblical number that I'm going to explain in a minute. But when he dates both of those texts with a 63, you know he's doing it on purpose to link them. Oh, so that's like a concordance. If Genesis 1, first sevens at 63, and it does, and Psalm 90, first sevens at 63, and it does, and Moses is writing both, and he did, then it's like, oh, he means you to look at Genesis when you look at Psalm 90, and he means you to look at Psalm 90 when you look at Genesis. So then you know both are talking about something at the same time. Now, the second 
time that the text sevens, and it's a cumulative thing. You have to keep counting the syllables. First time it sevens, okay, that's 63. The second time it sevens, in those two passages in particular, in Genesis 1, it's 119. And in Psalm 90, it's 84. Why? Well, those two numbers are related also. So now it's like a little game. See? They didn't have sophisticated toys. They didn't have TV. So how did you teach your kids and give them something to play with? Especially since you were training them at the same time, but you wanted to make it fun because learning is supposed to be fun. To the Jews, learning Torah is the biggest thing you can do. All right? So they wanted to make it fun. And the obvious God, when he wanted scripture written down by Moses, who's the first guy to write scripture, therefore setting a precedent, he wanted to make it fun too. Okay, so now let's get, let's play the game. First dateline, 63 in each passage, Genesis 1 and Psalm 90. The syllables, when they total 63, are pointing at each other. Well, but what is 63, Daddy? Well, son, 63 sevens before Moses wrote, Israel first went into slavery in Egypt. Oh, yeah, 309, 440, 441, right, Daddy? Uh-huh. And what is that 441? Um, 300 and, 390 years. 390 years that, 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 that Israel was in Egypt in slavery. And then before that, Joseph was in slavery for 10 years. They're not the same. They, they don't fit together. But it's a total of 400. Just like God said. And in, in, in Genesis, that we, that, that Abraham's children will be 400 years enslaved in Egypt. Very good, dear. Well, now what's the 41? Oh, 41 is the number of years. Well, actually, um, 40 years after God, 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 um, God took us out of Egypt. He split that water four years after, and he's writing at the very beginning of the 41st year, which is also the beginning of the 1051st year after the flood started. Very good, dear. Isn't that clever? So you would always be counting the syllables, and the date line of the writing is tied to something doctrinally significant to the passage. And how do you know? Well, if Moses is writing in the beginning of the 1051st year after the flood, how does Genesis open? With water. Because in Hebrew, the first verse in Genesis is not Genesis 1-1. That's the title. Genesis 1-2 is the first verse in Hebrew. And the Holy Spirit, um, I have a mother hand. The Holy Spirit was a mother hand, uh, brooding over the waters like a mother hand broods over her chicks. Very good, dear. See? So they're tying the flood to the first time that the world was under water at not an initial creation but at its restoration. Oh, so you see the Hebrew kids were learning a very different story from what we tell our kids today. Moses is writing at the beginning of the 1051st year of the flood, which is 63 sevens from when Israel went into Egypt, so the water and going through the water with the parting of the Red Sea. Okay? And when the world was underwater, getting ready to be restored by the Holy Spirit, all those concepts are linked in the very first verse that we call Genesis 1-2 
of Genesis. But it's also true for Psalm 90. Okay, but what is Psalm 90? A prayer by Moses, God, you're our refuge forever. Yeah, Israel just came through the splitting of the water. God is our refuge. The ark in the flood, God is our refuge. God is saving you through a difficult time. And he rescues the world in Genesis 1-2. All about rescue. All about coming through water. And that's at the 63, the 63rd syllable in Psalm 90 is the end of verse 4. Day of the Lord is as a thousand years. Isn't that clever? Time back to Genesis 1. And both are written in the 1051st year of the flood. Okay, so then what's, that's 63. Okay, we get that. What's 119? Because it's another date line? Did he write it at a different date? No, it's the same date expressed in a different way. Well, what is 119, Daddy? I forgot. That's how old Moses was when he wrote Genesis 1. Oh, yeah, because he died in 120. See how handy this is? And, you know, you're walking with your kids to, you know, like Abraham's walking his kids around the land. Well, Abraham didn't do this. Well, he might have been telling his kids a story. But Moses is wandering with the, you know, the people in the wilderness, teaching them all this. Very handy. 119. They'd already been in the land, see? Beginning of the 41st year after they left Egypt. And he's 119 at that point. So it's the same year. It's the same date expressed in two different ways that are doctrinally significant to the text. Is this clever or what? And then you say, well, my daddy, well, okay, I get that about Moses, 119 for the, the, the second dateline for Genesis 1. Well, what about Psalm 90? That's 84. What does that mean? Well, dear, how old was Moses? 119. Okay. And what was 84 years prior? Oh, that was when, that was when Moses left, left, uh, left, uh, when, when Moses stopped being feral. Right. And why did that happen? Because Hatshepsut died. And there was that, that, you know, that other kid. With the son of the con 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 concubine, and Moses did, Moses wanted God, and he wanted to go back to his own people, and had had said since had died. Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, and so he was there for about four years. And then, you know, he had the trouble with the Egyptian slave owner, seeing him beat a Jew, and then he killed the slave owner. And then what happened? Uh, he had to leave. He had, he, had to, he had to leave, Daddy. Very good. You see? So it's meaningful at both points. So then now you know that Psalm 90's timeline because that's the next meaning of this. Psalm 90 is a timeline. Genesis 1 is a timeline. And they tie to each other. And they talk back to each other. Kind of like, you know, and now I have to revert to a different analogy. Like in Catholics, when they had their songs or the Gregorian chant, you have one side singing the part. Ah, na, na. I can't sing this part right. You know, da 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 da, and the other part's going da 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 da, and they're supposed to be. They call that antiphony, and Jews had a strong uh, musical heritage of antiphony. I don't know how it works, but I know they had one. So you had two different groups singing in two different keys, kind of like in reply to each other. 
All right. And the closest analogy in modern day would be you had, you know, two sets of troops or two platoons and they're both walking in parallel to each other down a broad road. And you sound off, one, two, sound off, sound off, or however they do it now. You know, my, my knowledge of this is really old. Okay. When one side talks back to the other side, that's called antiphony in music. So it's an antiphonal relationship between Psalm 90 and Genesis 1. So now you know more about why that text is there, when it was written, what's its purpose, what's its backstory, and how to interpret the text. And when you're learning all this kind of stuff at five years old, it's a like a game. Wasn't that fun what we just went through? So imagine having being like Daniel. And since you were on your mother's knee, you were learning this. It would be second nature. I mean, kind of like multiplication tables. I mean, when you do the same kind of thing day in and day out, day in and day out, you have a job. And I bet there's some kind of part to your job that others would look at it and say, oh, that's complicated. But to you, it's not. Because you do it every day. And yeah, you have to think about it, but you don't have to think about it half as much as you used to. Because you've done it so much. Okay, so now get ready for this. Daniel, in Daniel 9, is praying to God and he's counting the syllables. Counting the syllables in the passages that he was just reading that prompted him to pray. In Jeremiah, which includes Jeremiah, Lamentations, and Chronicles, and the Book of Kings. And he is actually counting time from David at Hebron to the borderline that God had revealed to him with that man of time, you know, the head of gold and the chest of, of silver and, you know, belly of bronze. He's counting his syllables and counting the back years going to the forward years that are yet prophetical in time while he prays. And Mary does the same thing when she's talking in the Magnificat, tacking on to the end of where Daniel left off in his counting of syllables. I'm telling you, it blew me away. And it's real obvious they're doing that because when you got enough numbers and you got the text that's tied to the numbers and you got enough text, you can see where everybody's pointing at each other. And then Christ in Matthew 24, 25 tacks on to Mary. I haven't worked out all the details on that part yet, but he's definitely doing it. And so from Genesis 1, all the way through um, Matthew 25, you have, as it were, a multi-act play of time, counted annually, annually, each syllable for one year. And it's a satire on what? One theme, always the same, salt of the earth. How believers impact history. Have we always wanted to know that? Haven't we always heard, oh, you're salt of the earth, and we have no idea what it means. Yeah, well, the Bible gives us a lot of idea what it means. Like for 1960 through 2041 for Christians, we are foolish virgins. Matthew 25, verses 10 through 12. That's what covers our period in history. Now you see more of why I said what I did in the first of this current series of videos on Matthew 24, 25. It's got a history. It's got a connection. And it goes all the way back to Genesis with a discernible pattern. Not only that, but each of those numbers, as I started to say, you know, the 63 is doctrinally significant. And the 119 and the 84 are doctrinally significant. 
And you say, well, but you just told me what the doctrinal significance was. That's not the half of it. Just as, like, the word salvation is a key word, the word Messiah is a key word, and any any Bible scholar will tell you, you you organize scripture, you learn it, not merely by memorizing the text or reading the verses in context. You look for all the other passages that have the same keywords in them, like salvation, in order to discern the whole realm of that doctrine. Like when you see the word whore of Babylon in Revelation 17. That's not, that's an actual keyword. You have to go all the way back through the Bible and search on harlot or horror or, you know, whatever word you want to use. Strumpet, streetwalker. And it's always a metaphor of Israel leaving God to run after a false husband. And that's exactly the kind of analogy Christ is drawing in Matthew 25, 10 through 12, which is why John uses Whore of Babylon in Revelation 17. He's tying back to Matthew. False bridegroom, false husband, not really your husband, therefore you're a whore. Okay? When you're going after the wrong God, that's like betraying your husband. And what do men call their wives when they do that? And how do wives think that they are when they do that? Oh, you're no better than a strumpet. Ezekiel 16 is a really blistering passage on that. Okay, so then, as I started to say, the numbers have doctrinal significance like that, like keywords. Okay, so what's the significance of 63? Well, besides the fact that it means 63 sevens, 63 is seven, seven years short of 70. And why is that important? Oh, let's go look at Daniel 9.26. Oh, that's 483 out of 490 years. That's not 63. No, but what is 490 years? 70 times 7. Oh, and one of the sevens is missing for the tribulation. Uh-huh. So 70 minus 7 is what? 63! Oh! Well, well, why 70? Because God orchestrates time in 1050-year units that are 490 plus 70 plus 490, just like Moses structured Genesis 1, which is about the beginning of time. Oh, yeah, I remember. I'm sorry, Daddy, I forgot. Isn't that cute? You see how all this stuff is connected? You see how complicated it is? So that's why I've been working on it for eight years. It's like, oh, everything led to everything else. And it's like, you know, all this is forensic. And once you get all the the numbers together, then you go, oh, well, wait a minute, this ties to this, that ties to that, this ties to the other, and so now I have a whole construct, but for a long time, I didn't know all this, so it's kind of going to be fun and addicting to learn this meter, but I hope that this little taste, and I'm sorry it took me 20 minutes to do it, or nearly 30, gives you a sense of, Oh, well, then when Brainout's saying this thing about 1960 to 2041, she's not just pulling it out of the air. No. But it does take a lot of explaining. Sorry. Peace out.